So that's really my focus right now is to help other people avoid the pitfalls that I did of putting everything in a 401k and at the mercy of the stock market. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Before you invest passively, there's many things that you need to know. You definitely need to educate yourself. Our guest today, he didn't know about syndication for years and years and years, right? In the corporate executive position, all his money on Wall Street. And then he was exposed to syndication and he's dove in head first. He's helping lots of people to learn, obviously, how to invest passively and things you need to know. Our guest today is Matt Hansen. He's a retired corporate executive who transitioned to a full-time real estate investor. He is currently managing partner of Hansen Holdings. His investment portfolio includes over 2,000 units of multifamily apartments located in Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. He's going to go through many things as a passive investor that you need to know so you do not lose money. One crucial mistake that he made early on that resulted in a capital call. You need to know what it is, and you're going to learn that today. Matt, welcome to the show. I know you have transitioned full-time to real estate investing, and now you're investing passively in many projects as well. I'm just looking forward to learning from you and helping the listeners to learn from you on how you've done that you know, passive to active investing in real estate, what that looks like. And let's just jump right in. I mean, Matt, tell us a little bit about your business and uh, what real estate you've invested in and and maybe even why, you know, why real estate, right? Instead of just the normal path, right? For most people investing in Wall Street or whatever it may be. And let's dive in. Well, thanks, Whitney. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I'm a huge fan of yourself. So basically, I have a real estate investment firm called Hanson Holdings, and we focus right now on multifamily, large multifamily deals, helping people move their money from Wall Street to Main Street by passively investing in real estate. And as a retired executive, I was one of those people 30 some years ago that had 100% of their retirement funds in the stock market. And that's something I'm really passionate about, of just educating people. You need to have some of your money outside of the stock market. It's a little bit foolish. And I was foolish to have 100% of it in there up until probably six or seven years ago when I discovered multifamily and syndications and things like that. So that's really my focus right now is to help other people avoid the pitfalls that I did of putting everything in a 401k and at the mercy of the stock market. Did you retire from the corporate position and then learn about syndication and commercial real estate and investing passively? Or was it like before that and that helped you to retire? Or what did that look like? The timing? It was like four years before I retired. So I was moonlighting that confidentially. Nobody knew I was doing it. So I couldn't advertise it, but I would run deals from LOI to close with my business partner. So I was the guy behind the scenes doing all the work, the due diligence and all those things because I really couldn't, a conflict of interest couldn't publicize what I was doing because I was an executive at a Fortune 100 company. And they frown upon that a bit. So I was fortunate to spend four years doing that, building it up. And then about two years ago is when I when I retired and I could start. So it contributed to it. Frankly, I'm still not making as much as I did as an executive, understand that, but I have full control over my time and the freedom now. And it's a blast to help other people get into real estate passively. So that was kind of my journey in two seconds. Yeah. Speak to getting started passively. You know, you learned about that, you know, four years before you retired, but speak to learning the passive side of investing in a syndication, maybe some tips that you have for the listener who's wanting to be passive or maybe already is, but what did you do to learn the business? So you thought, okay, you know, I've been taught Wall Street my whole life. You're right. Most of us had been. And then all of a sudden there's this this thing we call syndication, right? That almost sounds scary <laughs> itself. But how did you develop a comfort level and education around, you know, syndication to be able to do it? Education, education, education. That's why what you do is so great is that I studied up, I joined a mastermind that was, and I passively invested through that mastermind for probably the first two years and tons and tons of deals. And you learn so much before you go and be a general partner or run a deal, you really need to be a passive investor, a limited partner and learn what it's like from their end. So I've learned a lot of things that I should and shouldn't be doing with all the investments that I did, like who's communicating really well, who's not communicating really well, who is honest about what's going on with the property versus hiding it and you find out later. And it's fine for them to get an answer before you share it with me. But if you just don't tell me about it and I find out much, much later, that's not real great. I mean, we're the limited partners are the ones that make those deals happen. 
If it wasn't for them, you couldn't buy the property. So I have a high value for the limited partners. And that's the way I make sure I treat anybody that invested with us is I've been on that side tons and tons of times. I know exactly what they're looking for. So education was the number one thing. And then vetting the sponsors. And that's something that early on, I made one big mistake on that. You know, had I been more seasoned and did a more thorough vetting, I would have probably avoided that one issue that I did encounter. So education is number one. You know, you've piqued our interest, right? You made a mistake. <laughs> a sponsor. I have to ask, right? Or if you're willing to share, you don't have to ask. Yeah, I am. I won't, I won't give but like, names or anything. You know, maybe share what you wish you'd have known, right? Back then. Right. So I'd invested in a deal. Actually, it was my second limited partner, passive investment. And I had knew the operator a little, but I'd known him for six months. He had great credentials. And he was the guy I was really investing, the key sponsor for it, the lead sponsor. And then he had two other people that were newer to multifamily that were like, they were well-educated and all that, but they're fairly new to it. Well, the guy I invested with about six months after the deal had closed decided, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do multifamamily. I'm going to do triple net, sle- triple net leases and other things in real estate. So he stepped away from the deal, leaving these other two individuals to run it. And they didn't really know what they were doing. Within six months, we had a capital call because they weren't on top of the property manager. Things went sideways at the property. And this was a 200 plus unit property in Texas in a great location. There's no reason for this other than poor management. So it was my fault by investing in vetting only one of the sponsors. You need to look at all the other sponsors. And most importantly, who is the asset manager? And my guy was the asset manager and he stepped away. The other partners, which really weren't qualified to be asset managers, assumed that role. So the lesson there was know all the lead sponsors or general partners. Who's going to run that asset after it's closed? That is the most important thing because you're married to them for the next five to six years. So that's that a, was my big takeaway. Yeah, that's that a great everybody. Point. It sounds like though, if he changed courses, like you, there's probably no way for you to have known that six months earlier. Oh no, there wasn't. It was he pivoted, but what I should have done is really said, okay, what if something happens to my buddy that's the lead? Right. These other two, are they going to really? And it actually, a third person actually came in and stepped in. There was a capital call. I refused to put more money into the deal. I said, you can dilute my my shares, but I'm not going to put more money into this. And we did end up selling it. I made a decent profit, but not as much as it should have been. It had it performed well over the whole period. But yeah, it really wasn't preventable, but it was on my end if I would have really, really. And so that's the one one tip is check out all the members of the team in case the person you invested with goes away. Yeah. And things happen, right? I mean, or people pass, yeah. unfortunately, or have an accident or whatever, go through a divorce or, I mean, just something horrible that takes them out of the business. So I think it's a great question. Who's second in command here, right? What happens? Yes. Who is that person? Yes. And so let's move to like, what are some say critical stats or things that, that you want to review before investing? We talked about, okay, we're going to vet that operator. Obviously most of us know about things that we want to know this operator, want to know they have the skill set, maybe track record, all those things. And who else is in charge, right? If something happens to them, what's some other critical stats, things that do you want to for sure see before you invest? And I think it goes back to the old traditional phrase in real estate, location, location, location doesn't only apply to single family homes, but to commercial real estate as well, even more important. So the number one is we only invest in Florida and Texas and Arizona. I'm looking at deals in Arizona now. It's locations, states that are landlord friendly, cities that are growth and that are have population growth and employment growth. You can have population growing, but if there aren't employers there to support that. So those are the two biggest things. And the markets that we play in, of course, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Jacksonville, Florida, and other locations in Florida. Those are the hottest markets. And the trend is not going to stop. It's not just, we're not buying out in, you know, I live in Michigan, love the state, probably won't own large multifamilies here. Maybe in the future, I'd like to own something in Flint just to help out or Detroit maybe. But, but in terms of profitability for that's more impact housing stuff, sidebar on that, that's a great thing to do. And eventually we will. But if you're passively investing and you're just getting started, go in the markets that that are really strong for employment and population growth because the demand is there. That's what apartments drive on. If you've got those two things, you're pretty much set. Then all the other, there's 42 line items we look at in our due diligence when we're buying a property. You know, we have market data saying, okay, what does this neighborhood look within a mile and two mile and three mile stuff you're already familiar with. 
Whitney, but some of the uh, listeners aren't, is that you have these, it's called co-stars, one of the big reports that just have industry data. So you can see what are the competition, what's your competition? What are their rate rents like? What are their occupancy rates like? What's the cost per their units and their amenities? Or are your amenities equal to theirs? So those are the types of things. And usually if, if you're going to invest with somebody that's really good, you're going to get that in their offering packet. But you want to make sure you read through everything. Do your due diligence on top of the uh, syndicators. Yeah, uh, hopefully you do get those things right. So, you know, you mentioned population, job growth, no doubt. Some of the most important things at location, right? All that's kind of yes. together there. Is there a way that you verify that or maybe a certain percentage you want to see in those things? Or how do you see that? Yeah, it's tough. You can all, you can Google everything. You can say, what's the historical population growth for Jacksonville, Florida? And if that percent is, you know, Three or four percent. Michigan's unfortunately a negative number, but in Florida, almost the whole state is a is a positive number. But specifically, Jacksonville is growing really fast and strong right now. And its prediction is it's going to continue. It's just not a bubble. It's not a one horse town where okay, there's one big employer, and that's another thing we avoid. I've had people bring me deals in a small town in Texas. Love Texas, but if there's one employer there that the majority of the people will work for. If that employer goes out, your apartment's going to go vacant or occupancy is going to drop dramatically. So we only look at cities that are 100, 200,000 people or greater to avoid that whole issue of potential employment or industries. You know, is there just one industry in that town? Those are the things you want to avoid. So that's the key. And it's all Googleable. It's all Googleable. Just do your due diligence. That's a new term, right? I just coined it. <laughs> You know, Michigan's just too cold for me. <laughs> it is for me too. We leave in the summer or in the winter. It's beautiful in the summer, yeah. but in the winter, yeah, we usually leave. So Matt, did you start just with some cash that you had on hand investing? Did you use retirement funds of some kind? What did that look like? And let's help the listener to think through that as well. Great question. So initially I used some retirement funds. You can take things out of, from a past employer your um, retirement funds in a 401k or IRA, and you roll it over to a uh, self-directed IRA and you kind of have checkbook control. There's lots of different vendors out there that do this and they specialize in this. And what it does, it allows you to passively invest. You can't invest in your own deals or buy your own properties. It's got to be, uh, it's called arm's length away. You can't invest with a family member or something like that up your lineage. It's got to be able to take that money and invest in a syndication which is another LLC, as long as you're not involved in that LLC. And you can passively invest in other things as well, not just real estate, you can do crypto, you can go precious metals and all those things. And I've done a lot of those things as well, but multifamily by far the most profitable in my favorite. So if you've got money sitting in an IRA, consider rolling it over into something that you have control over and get it out of the stock market. At least some of it, you don't have to take all of it. I've got about 20% of my holdings still in the stock market, you know, I'm not happy about it, but they're there. They're locked up in some things. But I think that's something that a lot of people just don't know about is that you can take your past employer's retirement funds, or if you've retired, and roll those and have access to them and invest in other things outside of Wall Street. Good Where question. would you start to take the next step to make that happen? You know, we hear that often. I hear, you know, some people are just scared to like do something else with it, right? are so scared of making that decision or, but you know, who should they contact or maybe who would be somebody they would look up to make that start to happen? Right. And we've got a rethink your retirement guide on our website that, that walks you through it. And I've got two, two companies that I work with rocket dollars, one of them and safeguards, another one that I've got affiliate, you know, okay. I've checked them out. My friends use them a lot. I use another one because I set mine up five or six years ago before I knew about them. But I vetted these these two companies really well. And my affiliate fee goes to my investors. I don't get the kickback on that. It goes directly to their discount to their, their membership of the uh, self-directed IRA company. So, But you can just Google it. Make sure you look for the ratings and reviews. And then educate. Consume all their materials. Rocket Dollar's got a great website and an ebook that's like 43 pages that tells you everything you need to know about it. So again, education, it's out there. I've got one of my investors right now that's setting one up. So I'm helping walk the way through the process and everything like that, because I've done a couple of these over the years. So just get out there. Don't be afraid. Get out there, educate yourself, and you won't be afraid. That's the key. So there's a couple of great resources out there. So a lot of good, big companies go with a big company that's got a great reputation and they'll walk you through the process as well. Knowledge is power, right? And that's what I tell our team too. Like if investors have questions, 
you know, and if we don't answer them, guess what? Their answer is going to be no. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So we answer their questions. We want to ensure we do that. Great example there. So you can use retirement funds. You can invest in real estate, many other things. And it's, it blows my mind how many people still don't know that, right? That That is an option. But what about, you know, after you've started investing, you know, you came from, let's say, Wall Street and you were, you learned about syndication and you started dabbling into that. Now you've invested many times across, you know, many different syndications as an LP. Well, is that your one and only path now? Are you diversifying into anything else or maybe different asset classes? Or is it like, I've got my blinders on, I'm just looking at multifamily in those markets? The majority of my holdings are in multifamily, but I got a list of other things that we've invested with, some of it with my retirements and some with cash, like land entitlement in Texas across from the uh, Tesla plant. I got a friend, she's probably been on your show, that I invested with her on that. And we bought some raw land, 140 acres, which is going to be explosive once the Tesla plant's in there. Oil, now this is uh, royalties for mineral rights for gold mining in Nevada. I'm invested in that. Got some crypto. I'm invested in two startup companies that are one's road construction and how to turn any local soil into pavement by mixing it with this powder and water. It's, in, it's, it's revolutionary. It's been approved by the DOT in a couple of states and eventually it'll be a global business worth billions of dollars. So yeah, I have the opportunity to take my retirement funds and put into some fun things like that. Some of them are really speculative, others less speculative. The multifamily, the far by far the most conservative and that's where the majority of my hold is. But you got to be, you know, once you get into it and you're comfortable, okay, I'm putting hundreds of thousands into, you know, these apartments, you get the comfort level that, okay, I can do this. I understand it. Those have turned out really well. We have probably 20 X our money, I think, in some of these investments over the last six years in terms of what I put into it, what I've got out of it. You just stuff you can't do in Wall Street. Give us some key lessons you've learned, you know, over the years in many projects, investing passively. You already shared one, which I thought was crucial or just really good as far as knowing, knowing who's second in command, right? Who's next when something happens to this operator, but what else? Is knowing yourself. Again, it's a comfort level. Now we do some risky stuff. We're fairly big into crypto, and, but I know that it could go to zero. You take that. So, so I think really it is starting with one thing, like you indicated, focus on that one thing, get really comfortable with that one investment and then expand from there. I think that's really what it comes down to is comfort level and knowledge level that, okay, yeah, this is okay. I can do this and go ahead and see results. I've got people that will invest with me after the first time they talk and others, it'll be a year or two years later. And I'm like, you know, I've been consuming your content. Now I'm comfortable. So do it at your pace. Don't feel forced or pressured. Set your goals, know yourself, what your tolerance is. Because the last thing you want to do is invest in something and then regret it later and say, or I needed that money for my kid's college fund or whatever. You need to know what your, you know yourself and what your goals are. And when you're investing in multifamily, your money is usually tied up for five or six years. Now, the last few years, we've been turning our properties in two to three years. But I think that's going to get stretched out as the economy changes a little on us here. So really know thyself is what it comes down to, I think. That risk tolerance, right? And I love how you brought that up because it depending on what, how old you are or where you're at in your life, things going on, it's different for lots of different people, right? Or how much capital potentially you may have to invest that way. Yes. You know, when were you comfortable, say, investing in something like a startup? You know, was it like after you've invested in numerous syndications and maybe you have some cash flow and it's like, okay, now I can do this? Or, or was it like, were you comfortable or you learned enough about these startups that it was like pretty quickly, hey, no, I like this. I'm going to put quite a bit no, of cash. It was years. I think the first thing I did outside of multifamily, probably two years, maybe more. I'd been passively invested in multifamily for two at least two years before I felt, hey, you know what? I'm comfortable with this stuff. I've got enough you know, money in the bank, so to speak, that, okay, I can take some risk with that. And then once you get it, it's addictive. It's really fun looking for opportunities. And I've got people I've met along the way that were in multifamily that moved on to do one of the individuals I do a lot of investing with, um, venture capital investing with, is somebody who started with multifamily six years ago, right? That it's you know, a great friend of mine that I know, like, and trust. I know this guy. I know he's vetting it. I know that I can check his work and it's good. So it took me a couple of years. It really does. But again, multifamily, much simpler than the stuff with the high risk, the super high returns. Some of those startups, I'm speculating they're getting traction is that you know I paid 20,000 a share. They're now, it's, it's not on um, 
we had a, a Wall Street company come in and evaluate, and they say they're worth about 66000 a share. And the speculation is they'll be six digits in the next few years as the, the company expands and expands. So that's stuff you just, and you need to know somebody to know somebody to get into a deal like that. That was an invitation only from somebody I personally knew. And there's only a handful of people that have access to it. And that's what's great about getting into a group like you are. We're in the same tribe of syndications. And all of a sudden, you find exposure to all these other things. And I will eventually be expanding those offerings to my investors. But for now, focusing on multifamily, really centering on that. Love that. Uh, how you brought that up too. And I've recently invested in a couple of startups as well. And one of those we actually did put out to our investor base too. And so oh. it, it was very interesting to see, hey, who's ready for this? And, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, because we didn't know what to expect from that, but it was successful. I was very surprised. Good. And, Good. It, and the startup's been successful so far too. So, but, And it's your track record, Whitney. That's it. People know, like, and trust you. I do, certainly. And this is the first time we've talked, but I've been wa- listening to your podcast forever. And I know you're a stand-up guy and I know Life Bridge and all the great things you're doing there. So that's what it takes is credibility is, and you've got that. So I, I can see why you'd be very successful in expanding outside multi. I appreciate your, your kind words. Matt, what would you have done differently other than have bought multifamily earlier or maybe more of it? You know, anything that you would have done differently if you could talk to yourself, say, six, you know, six years ago or whenever that was when you started learning about syndication? I probably would have started general partnering sooner. I think I was maybe three years in before I really started doing deals. I just passively invested because I just, and a part of it, I was still working, but I could have done, and I did do start, I did start that. But I, again, I guess it is back to, I would have started earlier doing that, but I was, you know, I was real hesitant. I really wanted to learn everything. I overanalyzed like a lot of people in this business. That's what we are. We're overthinkers. And I wish, I guess I, my answer is I just would have started earlier. I think everything I've done, other than the one deal that had a capital call, I feel pretty good about all my investments have been very solid. I guess vetting business partners, that's a challenge really, really. I mean, passively investing is one thing, but when you're partnered with somebody, really vet them well too. But other than that, I did early on made some poor decisions and partnering with some people that you know phased out. But that's the only real big lesson I think or anything I can think of. Just start earlier. <laughs> Yeah. What about predictions that you may have over the next six to 12 months? You're looking to invest passively in more deals or, you know, what are you going to invest in more deals over the next six, 12 months more than ever? Or are you, you know, are you holding back more or, or are you waiting on anything to happen in the market? Or you feel like it's just going to keep going like it's been going or how do you feel about it? Cautiously optimistic, I would say. I just passively invested in a, one of my friend's deals in Texas oh, a couple months ago. Oh, I invested in a vineyard in one of my other friends in Texas. That's fascinating. So I don't know. I'm probably not putting more money into multifamily because I'm over, I'm way too big a percent probably right now on multifamily, but that's my speciality. I understand and know that really well, but I do want, I'm really focused on my personal investings outside of this because I've got so much holdings in multifamily, but I think the market's still going to continue to go up. I wouldn't be investing into states that don't have the huge population growth and the employment growth. Because when the recession hits, those states are going to have problems because you don't have you have employers that are now, you know, maybe ratcheting down or issues like that. But you don't have the influx of people to replace those tenants. And you do in the states like Florida and Texas and Arizona. There's always population moving for whatever reason. So I think be really cautious where you're investing. I've I have people that don't invest with me, but ask me my opinion and they'll bring me a deal. And it's in a town of 20,000 people with one employer. I'll say, I would not do that. That risk is really, really high. You're better off in a larger state and a larger MSA or populated area. That's just too risky. So I would say I'm still very, very bullish on multifamily. Stick to the larger cities with the large population and employment. I think we're fine, but I think it's going to get a little, get a little rocky here in the, in soon. We need a plan for it to be rocky anyway, right? No, almost no matter what the market is doing. I want to plan for it to be rocky. I'm not sure I'm exactly I'm in the right tire zone, right? You know, for those rocks that are ahead. You know, with that thought, yeah. You know, how do you like to see an operator prepare for a potential downturn? We don't really know what's going to happen next right. month or six months from now, right? But when you're looking, you know, you're going to be passive in a deal. What do you like to see? What are some key things that say, you know, what I can tell that this operator he's conservative or whatever? And what does that mean to you, though? Uh, like, how do you see that? The number one thing is the stress test. And a good syndicator will sh- show you that, okay, we can go down to 65% occupancy and still make money and still cash flow. 
That's probably the number one indicator. Have they taken a look at that? And are they willing to share that with me? Because some deals may be 80%, you know, they're 98 now, but if you go down below 80%, now they're not profitable and the distribution stop. So I'd say that's the number one thing. We'll stress test the deal. And then just the normal things. Are they over bullish on rent growth? For example, in our, we've got a 506C that I can loosely talk about right now. It may be gone before this airs, but I can say, well, CoStar says that our rents are $538 below market. We underwrote in our projections, we only counted $250, even though the market is saying we could probably go up to 500. But we didn't take the $500 and put it in our underwriting and say, hey, investors, no, we were very conservative. No, we're going to do 250 because who knows what's going to happen in the future. Maybe we can't get the units renovated because of supplies or labors and things like that. So that's what I like to see is in a deal sponsor say, okay, that's really conservative because you've, you've shown me, here's what the market says. This is independent data, $538 a month. You're saying you're going to only get 250 like that. But I all see deals in the same market They'll be putting saying our rents are going to go up 450. Okay, I know the market says it's over 500, but really, do I want to invest in that one? Or the one that says they're going to do 250, because I know these guys have stress test on this, not the higher number. So that's probably the key thing: is just take a look at the numbers. Um, talk to somebody that's invested in other deals. I have lots of people that ask my opinion on deals that aren't even my own, and I'll give them my honest opinion: thumbs up, thumbs down, and here's why. So make sure you're talking to other people that have invested and see what their take is on wealth, just like you asked me, Whitney. How are you increasing your deal flow right now? It's difficult, obviously, with what's happening with debt and whatnot, but how are you increasing your deal flow? I've got some fabulous partners. And the deal is, once you get a deal with a property owner or a seller, you're more likely to get another deal. So the one, the big one in Florida right now, Ricardo, my business partner, has bought a property from them earlier this year. And that's why we got this property. So it's really, it, it's a very, you'll hear a very unfair business. It's who you know and who knows you really that, that counts. So deal flow is not a problem for me at all. I've got other people and I'm in a mastermind too. So I've got a core group of people I've known for years and years and years that I know, like, and trust that, and they've got deal flow like crazy. So I get calls once a week. Hey, Matt, can you help me raise money in this deal? You help me on this deal. And I said, I'm in two deals right now. That's all I can do. You know, put me on your list for the future. So that's not an issue from, fortunately, I'm, I'm in a group of some really strong performers that have got a great track record. So what a seller is always looking for of a buyer is certainty of close. They don't want you to tie up that property for 45 or 60 days and then not close on it. We have certainty of close. We have a track record that we're going to close on this deal if we get it. And I think that's really why it's not been an issue for me and my group. And it takes some time to develop that, right? And you just- Oh, years. Through. I mean, it's- yeah. Years. Nobody has a track record when they start, typically. Oh, no, right, you don't. So Matt, what's your best source for meeting new investors right now? You saturate you know, your friends and family, and then you go to the next circle and the next circle. I'm out, the next circle out. So I'm really working on social media to help people there. I'm going to be launching a LinkedIn campaign that, that's going to outreach to other, I worked for Dow Chemical Fortune 100 company. I've got lots of friends that have worked there still or that have retired from there that probably have all of their money in the stock market and at least get some of it out. So that's kind of my mission is to start with my friends on the outer group that they know of me or aware of me. There's probably a thousand people that were at manager executive level that would could really benefit from this. So that's my next step really is looking at, and we're working on it right now, a campaign to help other people like me that was suckered in to listen to what Wall Street said when I was you know, in my 20s, I put all my money in the stock market in my 401k. So that's really what I'm focused right now is that outer, outer circle helping people. What are some of the most important metrics that you track? It could be personally, professionally, it could be how many times you exercise during the week, or it could be how many calories or how many deals you underwrite. Wow, that's really good. Right now, it's the marketing metrics. I mean, are we, we've got a market, my wife is a phenomenal marketer. She's retired marketing director. So she does all my marketing reluctantly, does my website. So we're really looking at stats on that. Are people seeing are there, seeing our website? How much traffic are we seeing there? How many downloads are we getting of our Rethink Your Retirement Guide? And things like that, because that's more people we can help. That's one of the key metrics. And my personal life, I ride bicycle every other day. I do yoga every night before I go to bed. I'm very spiritual that way. Yeah, a little bit. I have crystals at my desk. Yes, I'm a little woo-woo, but it works. It's my life. So those are the types of things that I kind of measure or measure my success on. 
happiness, really. What about some habits? And you mentioned a few, but habits you're disciplined about that have produced the highest return for you. I think just a positive mindset. And it's hard sometimes. Before I go to bed, I say my mantras and all the things I'm grateful, my family, my friends, and things like that. I think that's really is just being centered and being grateful. That's probably my biggest secret to my success because things aren't easy. Things, I mean, it appears everything's great and easy and simple. It's not. We go through struggles just like everybody else does. It's just a matter of, you know, it's all up here. It's mindsets, almost everything. So I think that's really my secret to my success. How do you like to give back? Really working with other individuals that are trying to get into multifamily and preventing them from being fleeced in any way. So there's a couple of individuals that have come to me and say, hey, you know what? If I get a deal, I'll help them through the deal. Or again, anybody off the street wants their, my opinion. And again, it's my opinion. I'm not a licensed financial planner or, or a CPA or whatever. So I make sure they know that. But I want to guide you in the right directions to prevent you from making mistakes, most importantly, and just really flourishing. And, you know, getting the financial freedom that you're really looking for. Like we all, I think are ultimately wanting to do that. It's just great to get up in the morning. I go to bed at three or four in the morning. I get up at noon every day. That's my schedule because that's my body's schedule. I can do that. If you don't have control over your time, you can't do that. You can't live that way. So that's awesome. That's an interesting sleep schedule as well. It is. <laughs> it, <cool>. is. <laughs> it works. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Matt, pleasure to have you on the show. Grateful for you just breaking down some do's, don'ts, things that, that have helped you to be a successful passive investor. And now obviously you're helping lots of people just learn about, hey, you can use your retirement money to invest and grow it probably a lot faster, hopefully, you know, in real estate, right? There is an option there. So how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? Just go to hansonholdings.com. And I know Whitney will have it in the show notes and we've got lots of resources, learning materials there. I know people, what you, you just need to learn, learn, learn. So we've got a, lots of articles there. We've got the download, your rethink your retirement that talks to you about just exactly what we were saying, how to take your money from yourself, your IRA to self-directed IRA, and just an overall benefits and challenges in passively investing in real estate. Our full disclosure, I want you to know what you're getting into. So that's really the best thing. Get there, get educated, watch Whitney's show. Definitely too. That'll help you. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope you have liked and subscribed to the show. Please tell your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show. And I hope that you are learning and growing. Don't forget to go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing today.